and welcome to West Talk. Today is Tuesday, October the 25th, and as always, an excellent show from you for you here from the beautiful Rogers TV studio, Mount Bernard, Cornerbrook. Um, and as per the tradition of this season, we're starting with a book. A little something interesting uh, this week, Operation Masonic, a crime thriller. Who doesn't love an old Illuminati crime thriller? This one with uh, a story in St. John's. The Freemason's most worshipful Grand Master has been murdered. His body has been laid out in the ritualistic chamber of reflection at the Masonic Temple, surrounded by centuries of secrets. Royal Newfoundland Constabulary Inspector Nicholas Myra and Constable Donna Whiffen dig through thousands of years of history, secrets, scandals, and symbols in a hunt for the killer. The search leads them back to the Temple of Solomon and the first Masonic murder. And this story takes place underneath uh, the churches and old buildings of St. John. So really interesting, cool story by Flanker Press, uh, authored by Helen Escott. So check this out wherever you buy your great books uh, in Newfoundland. Our first guest joining us today uh, remotely from St. John's is Mira Buckle. Mira uh, has just released a new video program that was funded by Canadian Roots Exchange and is called Building Connections Through Youth Stories, uh, a great video that focuses on the importance of culture and tradition in Indigenous communities. Joining us remotely is Mira. Can you see us, Mira? Yes, all good. Hello. Hey, so uh, I watched uh, your video and it will be airing on Rogers in several places. Right now, I believe people can go on YouTube uh, and search for Building Connections through Youth Stories and uh, be led to the video. So everyone should go do that. But uh, what can you tell us about what uh, inspired you to, to produce um, this particular video and, and what it means to you? Yeah, for sure. So I really recognized in, in the community of Cornerbrook and elsewhere that Halibu First Nation was doing a lot of excellent cultural revitalization work. Um, they're hosting so many crafting workshops uh, such as beating and drum making, uh, dance and song workshops, um, and youth gatherings so that Indigenous youth can you know learn more about their culture and, and become involved. Uh, I attended my first youth gathering, uh, which was the first one they put off in 2019, and it was just a wonderful experience for me to meet uh, other Indigenous youth from all across the province in a really safe space where we could kind of, you know, learn about our culture more um, and, and meet each other and develop a community. So I think that with this film, I really wanted to show other Indigenous youth in our community the uh, amount of ways that you can become involved uh, in your culture and really um, and show kind of uh, that it's not intimidating and it's always a very safe space to uh, to become involved. Um, so I really wanted to highlight other Indigenous youth that are already involved in their culture um, to, to um, you know, encourage youth to, to get involved themselves. Yeah, and uh, the video definitely shined a, a really cool light on that, showing youth from our area who are having so much fun and uh, being so much so excited to to get their hands on with some of these traditions. And you know, and the video depicts things, um, just even simple things like gardening um, and self uh, sustenance techniques and traditions. So. How, how were you like introduced to this originally and what sort of exposure did you have growing up um, to, to these traditions and to this culture? Yeah, for sure. So it's um, a pretty recent, I think, endeavor to really um, share the culture uh, with the youth. I mean, the first youth gathering, like I said, was put off in 2019. So that was kind of my first time going to like a youth-centered event that Halibu has put off. Before that, I attended, you know, different ceremonies um, and, and things like that. But this was the first time that I felt like it was solely uh, for youth. And I think that's really important to be around your peers and to feel accepted and just to make friends, honestly. Um, so I kind of was in introduced then, but now over the past couple years, they have just went above and beyond and offered so many different workshops on their Facebook page. I feel like every day there's something new posted that uh, youth especially can take part in. So um, I guess I just wanted to, like I said, publicize that mm -hmm. and show youth all the amazing opportunities they could have uh, when they get involved. 
Yeah, it is really neat, and it makes sense to me that, I guess, unfortunately, that this is sort of a newer opportunity, these spaces where uh, Indigenous youth can get together, learn these traditions, celebrate them in a fun way. Um, you know, and even when I think back to my own childhood and, like, what would have been available to learn those skills. Like, for someone, a youth who wanted to learn uh, outdoor skills and traditional living skills, they pretty much had to like join army cadets or maybe the Boy Scouts or something, which in a lot of ways is, you know, I can understand why not the best way to learn these traditional skills. So where would you point people now? Like, do you, you know, where do you think if there's young people listening to this and they're like, yeah, I, I want to learn more about this. I want to gather with my peers. Um, what, what types of things would you suggest? Where's the best places to find this information? Yeah, so I mean, I think social media really is the center for all of this. So I know that Halibut First Nation has, you know, a great uh, Facebook page where they're constantly posting events and activities that people can take part in. So I really think that that would be a good first step. Um, there's also a Halibut Youth Network page. Um, I think you need to be, I think it's a, a closed private group. But I mean, of course, if you contacted um, even myself on Facebook, just look on my name, you know, I'm sure I could add you to that group but I think really social media is the way that we can all communicate best because um, like I said with the youth gathering that I went to that's when that Facebook group was uh, started that Halibu Youth Network face, uh, Facebook group was started and it's with youth all over the province so I think that that's a great way where people can you know come together and, and talk with each other um, but I do think um, Facebook is a great way to learn about events. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's the way that uh, people are marketing and advertising their events now, so very important. Um, if you were to think forward and think about a future, what would you love to see in terms of like youth um, camps and gatherings and opportunities? What do you think the best case, the ultimate uh, Indigenous gathering for youth would look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, like, like I said with this project, you know, um, I think looking at the past, it's super important to recognize um, the wrongdoings of Indigenous people against Indigenous people and, um, and you know, the struggles that, that come with uh, in Indigenous people living in, in uh, Canada. But I think with this project, I really want it to look forward to the future and youth are really the future for cult cultural revitalization. I mean, the youth of today who are learning this stuff, who are participating in this, they're the ones in the future that are going to um, lead these sorts of events. And that's why it's really important to kind of foster this knowledge in youth now and allow them a space to learn um, because then they can, they can keep it going into the future um, mm. and uh, then become elders themselves in their communities. I really enjoyed the youth gatherings that I went to. They were at uh, West Haven in Pasadena, and the second was near Holyrood and St. John's. So really spreading out across the province where youth can meet up. Um, you know, for Pasadena, I had to drive 30 minutes, but for some other people, getting there was an eight-hour drive. So I think being outdoors in nature around the province in different locations, you know, meet, meet youth, meet your peers where they're at, um, that was all really important. And also having elders at these sorts of events where you can uh, talk with them and learn from them is extremely important uh, because there's a very special relationship between youth and the elders. And that's how we can really learn more about our culture is through them. Um, Halibut's did an amazing job with that, and they've continued even through COVID to provide gathering opportunities. So I think into the future, it's only become it's only going to become a bigger a bigger thing for youth to take part in. And those are usually you know like two nights, so you can really bond with the people there and stay with them. And um, there's just so many wonderful activities planned. So I think just you know continuing that sort of gathering um, would be would be excellent. Awesome. Yeah. And, uh, and you think, you know, you're just going to see more and more uh, uptake in the interest and participation in these things. Because, I mean, look, there's thousands and thousands uh, of Indigenous youth in Newfoundland and in our, even in our region. Um, and so it's so exciting to see these opportunities uh, coming together uh, for everyone. 
So with regards to the video in itself that you produced, uh, can you tell me about that process and what motivated you to take that direction of producing this film as, as the way to communicate the message that you're trying to get out there? Why film? Yeah, for sure. So like I said before, I feel like social media is kind of the center of all the information now. Um, during COVID, I was a member of Theater Newfoundland and Labrador, and we used to do, you know, skits and plays in real life. But then when COVID hit, we had to transfer all that to online. So that was kind of my first experience with film, like filming little uh, comedic skits and things like that. Um, and I really loved it because it, it was so permanent. It felt like it could be uh, put out there and shared with, you know, just about anyone. And so I knew that if I was going to do a project like this, I'd want it to be like widely shared and easily accessible. Because like you said, they can just go and look up building connections through Indigenous youth stories on Inst on uh, YouTube, sorry, and uh, you can you can find it. So um, I also um, worked with PB Productions on this with uh, John McKinnon. He's an excellent uh, filmmaker and uh, he really helped my uh, my vision come to life. So I think working with someone like that too made the process just uh, uh, easy breezy and um, I, I really like the film process, the filmmaking process, especially when it comes to kind of this documentary style. It was really nice just to sit down with the youth in their own homes or in their own backyards and just hear them talk. And all the editing and all that, you know, can come afterwards. But for that moment, they're just really sitting and talking to me off camera and and telling uh, me about themselves and about the ways they get involved. So it's a very personal, um, a personal experience, I think. Uh, and uh, I just really felt like film would be a, a great way to, to preserve these stories. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, shout out to PB Productions, to John, to Peter. Uh, the video itself was amazing, spectacular quality. It was one of the first things I noticed and was asking our producer, Gian, like, wow, who made this video? Because it was great. Um, and I could, I, now that I've spoken to you, I can sense your spirit in that video as well. And uh, it, now it makes a little bit sense where some of this direction was coming from. And so uh, I hope to see more of these types of films uh, produced through you and by you. I definitely think you've got a future um, at helping people tell their stories, right? It's one thing to have a story, but then the way in which that story gets delivered, uh, the devil's in the details, and I think you nailed it. So thank you very much for sending that over, uh, and I'm excited to see this video in the rotation on Rogers TV. Perfect. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. And that was Mira Buckle, and you can check out her video, Building Connections Through You Stories, on Rogers TV or on YouTube. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with Samantha Young from the Food Producers Forum. Stay tuned. So why volunteer at Rogers TV? Well, it's fun, exciting, and challenging. You can develop practical, hands-on skills in TV production, make new friends, and have fun, all while giving back to your community. For a few hours a week, you can be part of a great team making great local television. Want to find out more? Get in touch with us at RogersTV.com. Make your mark and find a new passion as a Rogers TV volunteer. And we're back as promised with our next guest, Samantha Young. And Samantha is the executive director at the Food Producers Forum. She's here today to tell us more about a new survey that's out uh, about the garden in your backyard. Samantha, thanks for coming down today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. First of all, what is the Food Producers Forum for the folks at home? Totally. So uh, Food Producers Forum is a provincial-wide not-for-profit that is built sort of to understand more about how to get education around people growing food. So we're trying to figure out how people, well, we're trying to figure out exactly um, what information people need to be growing food, what the gaps are when people want to start growing food and don't know how, and how do we support um, all of the sort of food production facilities that are happening in Newfoundland. I really think that so many people think that Newfoundland is not a place that you can grow food, and one of the things that we really want to focus on is making sure that people know that you can. You can grow almost anything here. It's amazing the things that you can do when you know how to. So getting that information out is something that we focus on. And so you work with both, I guess, the spirit of the forum is to work with larger scale food producers as well as at home, sort of the backyard people, anyone at any scale who's producing food in the province, right? Exactly, yeah. So for a lot of people growing food, 
they might not know, they might know how to grow one thing really well, but they might not know how to grow carrots or something mm -hmm. like that. So a lot of the time there are these larger scale producers who have this information who might actually be able to share that with smaller growers or have that connection be made. Right. So that's one of the things that we really try and do as well. We have full-time full farmers that we work with who are looking for a little bit of information or support, but we also want to be supporting people who are growing cilantro in their little front yard. So okay. it's, it's all scales. Okay, that's interesting. So if I have a little arrow garden growing tomatoes and herbs in my yep. window, I could be part of this situation. Absolutely, and, and that's sort of what the survey is focused on, is we want to understand at all scales what food is being grown. Okay, let's jump back then. And so this survey that, mm -hmm. uh, that we're going to discuss today, uh, what is it, who's it targeted at, and where do people find this survey? Well, I'll start with the who is it targeted at because that answer is so easy. It is anyone that grows anything who lives in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, and the any thing food. that any food, any food. Um, and the other thing about that is if you turn that into something else, like any secondary processing, that's another thing that we want to learn more about as well. So we, it, it is literally anyone. Like we have full scale farms that we are getting information from with like thousands of pounds of food that's being grown, but that there's no statistical analysis on. But then we also have people who have fish tubs in their backyard who grow enough potatoes for their family for the year. We also have people that are trying to grow food for the first time ever and are really proud of even just like any, any, anything green that comes out of the ground, even starting with salad or anything like that. So it's exciting. Yeah, it's yeah. everybody. And like, there's something about growing food and learning about food that brings people together as well. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's the who and the why. Why should people participate in this survey? What would be the end result? Yeah. So, I mean, my personal why is I want to know why or how much food is actually being grown here. So, I mean, the why for me is that, but the why for everybody else is that if there is proof that there is value in the food that's being grown here, there's a possibility that there's support that can be available. The provincial government has all of these wants to see um, more food production happening in Newfoundland, and what I and Food Producers Forum believe is that that food is already being grown here, it's just not being recognized. So the survey is mainly meant to have an understanding of exactly what food is here, but in a fully anonymous way. We don't need to know who you are, where you are, or anything like that. We just want to know how much is there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, maybe there's some people at home now raising their eyebrows, being like, oh yeah, the <laughs> government wants to know how many potatoes I grew this year so they can lay a tax on me for my potatoes and carrots. What do you say to that? That has already come up. That's a conversation that we've definitely had to kind of come across. And the main thing that I really have to say to that is I promise we're not the government. Um, this is really a project based in people that already know something about growing food that want to see more people doing it. We want to be able to support everyone that wants to grow something. And the best way to do that is to understand how much is there and understand what supports people need. So mm. by understanding what people are growing the most, the Food Producers Forum can then focus on those things and possibly in the long term find ways to build provincial wide supports that are available, things like cold storage and the things that maybe we don't know that we need yet. Mm. So that's kind of the point of that survey is figuring out where, where we go from here. If the goals for Newfoundland are to be more food secure, what things do we need to really support that in people? And do you see a future yourself now? Do you see a future where sort of part of Newfoundland's food security get solved in people's backyards and that people sort of take this on themselves and the, you know, the idea of the community garden is just infectious? Absolutely. I mean, community gardens are an amazing place for people to learn about food, um, but it even doesn't have to be that. It can be in people's backyards. And I really do think that a lot of food security and dealing with the raising cost of food, it doesn't need to come from grocery stores that those prices are going to keep going up yeah. and being able to grow something in your backyard might be able to lower those costs. Mm. There is that time aspect that does go into it, but as you learn and as you learn from other people, that time need goes down. Yeah. Um, when you can just sort of throw your potatoes in the ground and kind of keep an eye on them and then come up with an amazing bounty, yeah. it's such a good feeling. Like, I, I can see the benefits of 
expecting people to be growing something, and not even expecting, but hoping. There's so much value in that that I think that people recognize, but we can kind of recognize more as a community. Yeah, no, mm. that's really well said. I can definitely visualize some, you know, this kind of utopia, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> you know, and I think in Newfoundland as well. Like, it's not exactly the easiest place to to grow things generally. But now technology is coming a long way, and mm -hmm. people can grow like in their homes fairly easy. Uh, there's all all these consumer grade hydroponic gardens and things mm -hmm. you can set up in your house. So, I think that's really interesting. How much of that sort of side of of growing do you think will become a big thing here in Newfoundland? Like, do you think that's the way forward? Sort of hydroponics, greenhouse, that type of thing. I think there's a need for it all. Um, there are so many different ways, but the, um, the chair of Food Producers Forum, who I work with, um, I know that he's able to grow kiwis outdoors, like in Newfoundland climates on mm. the East Coast. So it's not that we need these technologies, but these technologies make it so much easier for people to get started. So there's definitely a value in it, but I, I don't think it's the only answer, but I definitely right. see it as part of the answer. <laughs> and those technologies keep changing. Like, yeah. they're becoming cheaper, the grow lights are lowering in cost, yeah. and if people have space availability, it's a great option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, you, you believe then that there is an actual chance that with good data in the future, the government could actually start supporting people. You know, you can visualize programs that could be in place to help people offset cost to say grow their own food at home on that yeah. level not just farmers and agricultural players but sort of on this individual basis yeah and i would love to see that and even not fully government supported but even not-for-profit organizational mm. um non-government organizations everything like that i think there's an option and a possibility for this future where people are supported there's space for people to learn there's possibly funding opportunities where people mm. can sort of show that they have interest in learning these things and then these skills are shared back with them. Yeah. Because the other thing that we're coming across is there's a, a generational gap in knowledge where for most people throughout history in Newfoundland, the sharing of knowledge on how to grow in this area was shared through families. Mm. Um, that then changed because um, the Newfoundland culture changed. It, growing your own food wasn't something you did, it was something you did because you had to. Yeah. And so people wanted to move away from that, and then there was this generation that didn't learn how. So that is another part of it as well, is sharing that knowledge and getting people back into want, being able to grow food because they want to, not because it's a necessity. Yeah. And then having these sort of spaces available that they can learn. Mm -hmm. I love it. I mean, just uh, I you know, become obsessed with houseplants in the last few years. Lovely. And, uh, you know, one internet bonsai tree turned into it, now my house is full of plants. But it's because I realized that, you know, there's these little, there's this thing that happens when you're cultivating this life in your house. It's like little miracles, yeah. you know, happening all the time. And then um, for Father's Day, I was given an arrow garden, Hello. started growing like herbs and tomatoes and things like that. And that was really mind blowing to mm -hmm. just be able to pluck a fresh cherry tomato out of my windowsill in like February was super fun. And so I think, yeah, I think that people will find um, by producing their own food or mm. producing anything that there's this extra little dopamine hit that you get there, this extra layer of satisfaction. And I think, you know, on a big scale, I can picture this being not only good for, for food security, but good for mental health and just well-being. And if the end result is more people are out in their backyard, more sticking their fingers in the dirt, I just think that's going to be a win no matter what. It is. It has such a benefit on mental health and everything. And it also, it's not just you. You have to speak to people to learn about it. Yeah. You're involved with people in your area, and you have to be speaking to people close by. Like, the thing about microclimates and gardening is that it's so specific to your area. Mm. So, like, even different parts of Corner Brook might have different growing temperatures and things like that. And so, yeah, you learn a lot from your community through food. And I find that a really interesting part of it as well. But it, the, the survey itself is one of those options where we're trying to learn exactly what other people need as well. Mm. So it being fully anonymous is one of the really big things that we want to focus on, is we promise we're not trying to find out anything about you. We just want to know what you're growing. So that's, that's yeah. the big thing there, yeah. Cool. 
Well, I think that's a lot of information, a great overview on who should participate and why they should participate. So in the last uh, moment of our interview, can you tell us how people can uh, participate in the survey and what the best way is to find more about the Food Producers Forum? Absolutely. So as always, it's pretty well to go to our website, um, www.foodproducersforum.com. Um, right on that first page, there's going to be information about find the, um, the link to the survey there. There's also posters up throughout Cornerbrook. That's kind of the only place that I've been able to get them with these little QR codes. Cool. Um, and we're trying to share as much information throughout different community groups as well. So there's QR codes around everywhere um, with information on how to do it. But probably the website is the best option. Cool. Samantha, thank you so much for your time today thank and you. telling us all about this. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Stay tuned. So why volunteer at Rogers TV? Well, it's fun, exciting, and challenging. You can develop practical, hands-on skills in TV production, make new friends, and have fun, all while giving back to your community. For a few hours a week, you can be part of a great team making great local television. Want to find out more? Get in touch with us at rogerstv.com. Make your mark and find a new passion as a Rogers TV volunteer. And that's it for our episode today. I want to thank Mira Buckle for chatting with us on the line, as well as Samantha Young uh, for coming down in studio to tell us more about the Food Producers Forum. And if you grew anything in the last little while, from a carrot to basil to anything, you should participate in this survey. Who knows? It could benefit us all in the future. Until next week, thanks for watching West Talk. Have a good night. about this program, we'd love to hear it. Email or call us or send us your feedback through social media. It isn't the heavy trays that make the job difficult or the fast pace you need to keep up. It's not working another double because someone called in sick. What makes the job tough is the moment you realize a customer has had enough you have to make that decision not to overserve. Refusing service isn't personal, it's the law. We know it's not easy, but we're counting on you to keep us all safe. Thank you, servers, for doing the tough job. Watching hockey just got a power play with NHL Center Ice and Super Sports Pack. With up to 37 out-of-market NHL games a week, you'll always catch your favorite team no matter where you live. Whether it's big matchups you're looking for or following your top fantasy picks, it's all here. NHL Center Ice, part of the Rogers Super Sports Pack. All this for only $35.95 a month. Say Super Sports Pack into your voice remote to order.